is uh, Professor Kevin Xu. He is a professor at the Louisiana State University. And Kevin will talk about uh, shelf sediment transport during hurricanes uh, Katrina and Rita. Thank you, Albert. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Xu. I'm a sushi professor from SU. I also serve as the interim director of the uh, Coastal Studies Institute. So today I would like to talk about a paper published in 2016. Um, at the beginning, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, including Rangeli Meiki, who is now in USGS St. Pete, Jim Chen from Northeastern, Carney Harris from WIMS, Rob Hetland from Texas A&M, Colleen Hu, who is now at Tulane University, as well as Jiazhe Wang, who is at UMCES, and she's also in the meeting. So why do we care about hurricane-induced sediment transport? Well, this has been a very hot topic over the past several decades. Many scientists would like to know the seabed erosion and deposition during the passage of hurricanes. Unfortunately, the observation of a hurricane-induced sediment transport is very, very limited. And if you use a numerical model, in many uh, situations, the model can blow up during the extreme condition uh, in the passage of hurricanes. So we have used a modeling system, which is based on regional ocean modeling system. And the sediment part was developed by CSTMS. Back in 2011, we published a paper on continental shelf research to look at the dispersal of the Mississippi and Atchafalaya River sediment. So based on that work, we look at the seabed response during the passage of two hurricanes, Katrina and Rita. So we are fortunate to have some very exciting observations from Gorney et al. 2007. They actually went out after the passage of the hurricanes to collect the sediment cores, and then they, they did some radionuclide and X-ray analysis to quantify the post-hurricane sediment deposit. So when we run the numerical models, we had to do more than 22 sensitivity tests. Uh, the parameters we looked at were mainly on settling velocity, critical shear stress, as well as erosional rates. So now let's take a look at the uh, model setup. So the top figure is the model grid, which was developed by Rob Hetland from Texas A&M. And you can actually see the passage of uh, the track lines of uh, two hurricanes. Um, so here I'm using a red circle as a laser pointer. Uh, this is Hurricane Katrina, and he, this is Hurricane, uh, Hurricane uh, Rita. And then regarding the seabed sediment, we actually interpolated the mud fraction using U.S. seabed database, and we actually got some help from uh, Chris Jenkins. So as you can see, in the inner Louisiana shelf, you have lots of a red area, which is very muddy, but we do have some coarser area, which is composed of a lot of sand, including several major submarine shoals. And the southern boundary is in blue, and this is artificial. We actually just added a lot of a coarse sediment along the model boundary to minimize some artifacts. And let's take a look at the model validation. So um, we selected uh, four stations going from east to west. If you see those five-digit numbers, they are actually from the NOAA NDBC buoy stations. And BURL1 is right on the Mississippi Delta. So during the passage of Hurricane Katrina, you can actually see almost a 50 meter per second of wind speed, which is a huge number. And then um, it, after the passage, uh, about one month later, there was Hurricane Rita, and Hurricane Rita also caused a lot of uh, energetic wind in the uh, western part of the model domain. And in general, our model matched the observation very well. 
but you can see that in panel B and C, we did not have much of observed data due to the damage of the Hurricane Katrina. And then we also um, compared the modeled wave height with observed uh, wave height. During the passage of uh, Katrina, you can actually see almost 18 meters tall of waves. And this is actually a huge number. And then in another station at uh, CSI 6, we also saw a significant um, number of wave height, which was around six meter. And then uh, during the passage of uh, uh, Hurricane Rita, we actually saw a really, really large number. And you can also see a wider peak, which is in response to the slow movement of the Rita. So now let's take a look at some modeling results. We have a total of six panels. Left three panels are for Katrina, right three panels are for Rita. So if you look at the wind field, the maximum wind field are actually those warm colors over here for Katrina, over here for Rita. But I want to uh, draw your attention to the asymmetrical wind field, okay? In general, east of a hurricane track, you would normally see stronger winds and taller waves, uh, as well as very large nearby wave orbital velocity. Using Katrina as an example, we even saw almost three meter per second of maximum near bed wave orbital velocity. In a fair weather or moderate condition, normally the wave orbital velocity is like a 0.1 or 0.2 meter per second. So this is a very, very extreme condition. And now let's take a look at the conditions during the peak of the hurricane. Again, left the two panels for Katrina, right the two panels for Rita. So uh, during the passage of the Hurricane Katrina, this is right before the hurricane made the landfall. You can actually see very large wind field, very strong, uh, very tall wave east of the track line. But if you look at the bottom shear stress, you actually can see lots of a high bottom shear stress in the inner and the middle part of the continental shelf. So to some degree, the bottom shear stress is mainly controlled by the uh, topography or the symmetry. So now let's take a look at some numbers on the seabed. So we actually extracted information from a total of four stations. Going from east to west, we have four triangles. We have the MISS, which is a station near Mississippi, and we have AB5, 10B, HC, and those are actually three stations mainly used for hypoxia studies by many, many scientists. So to the left, we have wind speed on top, which indicate a very, very strong wind during the passage of Hurricane Katrina, a very large um, shear stress generated. And here near Mississippi Delta, the black line indicated that the shear stress is almost a 50 Pascal. And if we compare this number with a fair weather condition, in a fair weather condition, you probably have a number somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 Pascal. And because of very extreme and energetic condition, uh, we saw huge seabed erosion. So if we look at the black line, the Mississippi River Delta, about one and a half meter sediment was eroded in the shallow water and transported into the deeper part of ocean. And then we also saw some centimeter uh, to up to a meter level of a seabed change during the passage of uh, Rita. So to wrap up, uh, we have three major conclusions. So if we compare two hurricanes, Katrina followed a very short perpendicular track. It was moving very fast and the energy dissipated only within two days. In contrast, Rita followed a more short oblique track Okay, so it went across the entire Gulf of Mexico and it actually moved a little bit slower over a longer uh, distance in the Gulf area. Because of that, uh, you will see a longer impact from um, Rita. And then if we think about the spatial variations, if you are east of the hurricane track lines, most likely you will experience stronger winds, taller waves and deeper 
erosion and a thicker post-hurricane deposition as well. Um, there are still lots of uncertainties in the model, but based on our sensitivity test, we believe that the hurricanes can actually disturb the sea flow at centimeter to meter level of change. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for your 